that's where a lot of people are met with frustration and uh, disappointment. And I know I've been there because I, I've never had somebody who, who said, Angelo, I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to tell you everything I know. And they do your best buddy and you go fishing and you hold hands and you skip into the sunset. <laughs> and you know what? Sorry to say to anybody listening that I'll, I hesitate to say never, but probably will never happen. But I'm sure if you've been in the industry five, 10 years, you can think of two or three people right off the top of your head that had an impact on your career. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Young Electrician Podcast. My name is Ruben Young, aka The Young Electrician. Here in this podcast, we like to see electricians grow, not just in the field, but also in their personal lives. We believe that your work life and your personal life should complement each other and not compete. With that said, today I got a very special guest, Angelo Suntries. Welcome to the podcast, Angelo. Uh, a little bit about Angelo. He wrote a book that I really like and I highly suggest. It's called The Human Side of Construction. And I wanted to bring him on the podcast to talk a little bit about the book, but specifically a little bit about what he talks about in regards to mentorship in the book, because construction in construction, in the heart and vein of construction, uh, we have the journeyman apprentice relationship. So we know about passing on information, but I feel like in the realm of mentorship, it's a little bit different because in mentorship, you could get career advice. You could help plot out your life figure things out. And I feel like that's something that's added on top of the journeyman apprentice relationship. So I really wanted to invite him on to just talk a bit about that and give his insights because I really enjoyed what he shared in the book about it. So Angelo, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot, Ruben. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the intro. You make it sound a lot cooler than it is, but uh, no, I, I really, really appreciate that. I appreciate what you're doing for the industry too. So thanks Thank for having you. me on. I've done it no service. Your book is awesome, man. I genuinely, <laughs> I genuinely enjoyed your book. Um, Thank you. And I read a lot, so that's saying something. Oh, wow. um, you need um, more special. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, Angelo, uh, would you just share a little bit about yourself, who you are, just so the uh, the listeners can get a uh, feel for who you are? Sure. Yeah. No, that's a that's a good place to start. So, yeah, my name is Angelo Santries and founder of Human Side of Construction. Um, I've been doing this now almost two decades, so it'll be next year. I'll be 20 years in the industry. I'm actually a mechanical engineer. That's what I went to school for. And so I did my schooling in uh, London, Ontario here. And then when I graduated, I was brainwashed by the system and I thought I was going to be the best uh, HVAC engineer in the world. And so I started to pursue a job as a consultant. And in the late 2000s, when I was had just graduated, um, we were com coming out of a recession and jobs were kind of hard to come by. So, you know, I started to look for engineering jobs, couldn't find anything. Um, I was running out of money. I was living on hot dogs and I was like, you know what? I got to find something. So I just started applying to jobs. I ended up working for a construction company and I thought it was just something that I was going to buy some time and uh, pay the bills. And I ended up falling in love with the industry right away. And uh, anybody who's been in it, I know you probably share a similar story. A lot of people I talk to, um, kind of fall into the industry. So, so yeah, I, I started, you know, kind of in, on, in the office as a project coordinator slash estimator, but I learned pretty quickly that even though I did four years of school, post-secondary school, I really didn't know anything. And I think that was probably the most important moment in my career was when I first came out and I first started working, um, I was put, um, I was paired up with a refrigeration technician. Okay. So for two weeks, I rode around in a truck and we went to service calls and stopped by some construction sites. And here I am like freshly graduated as an engineer. And I'm thinking like, the fuck am I doing here, man? Like I'm an engineer. <laughs> what the hell am I wasting my time doing this? But this, the second day we went into a mechanical room and the guy I was with, he was a bit of a dick. He was an older guy, but in a good way, he was a hard, tough love. So we walk in a mechanical room on a service call and uh, he points at this big chunk of metal okay he goes you know what that is mr engineer and i said i have no idea he goes that's a chiller and right away i was like holy shit because i remember learning about it and i remember seeing pictures and doing calculations but actually seeing it and and touching it and the valves and the pumps electrical connections it, it a light bulb really went off in my head and mm -hmm. that's 
it really became practical. And that's when I fell in love with, you know, the hands-on part and the logistics of uh, being on site. Another thing too, that I noticed early on in my career was, um, you know, the communication side was really lacking in the industry. A lot of you're very good, good people, technically, like hard skills. If you're on the tools, you know, you learn how to work tools safely and safe work procedures and uh, how to take measurements and do layout and weld and all that stuff. But there wasn't a lot of like interpersonal communication training, if any. But it, what's funny is, what do you spend most, if not all your day doing, especially if you get to a supervisor, you type form and type role? You're working with people. You're solving problems. You're having difficult conversations. So, yeah. So I noticed there was kind of a big gap there. So as I kind of grew and got more experience, I worked mostly on the sub trade side um, in the office. I worked for a GC. I went to the owner side for a couple of years, but I saw like these issues were kind of the same throughout the industry, depending regardless of which side you're on. And as my experience and passion grew for the industry, so did my frustration. And it all kind of came to a head when I started a couple of years ago, posting on social media by Fluke about this human side of construction, the interpersonal side. And it really took off. It got a lot of engagement right away. So I thought, you know what? There's something here. Some people want to hear more about this. So I started to put a little bit of pressure and exploring different things that people were into. And it turns out that you know, a lot of people agree with uh, with the stuff I'm putting out and how the industry needs to improve on one hand, but also all the positive aspects of the industry that kind of get swept, swept under the rug or go unseen by the general population or other people in the industry. Um, let me know if I'm going too long here, Ruben. No, please, continue. Probably... <laughs> yeah. So, so then the posts kind of the floodgates opened once the content started coming out. I had I started having conversations like this with some really cool people. And uh, it led me down the path of publishing the book because every time I would write a post, I'd have to delete three quarters of it because it was too long. I said, fuck it, you know, just keep writing, let it come out and, and see what comes of it. And then the book kind of came together. So ultimately, the book is one part of the mission, but the whole purpose of what I'm doing which I've monikered the human side of construction is twofold. And I'll stop after I explain the two and then we'll get into talking about some other stuff. Number one, improve awareness and appreciation for the construction industry for the general population. Because one thing I find super frustrating is that, you know, construction is ubiquitous with society. Without construction, we wouldn't have anything. You talk about doctors and researchers and all these people, they use the stuff that we build, the stuff that we design. Like without construction, there is no progress in humankind. Yeah. Yet we're treated like second class citizens a lot of the time. And people don't even understand what the hell's going on, like what it takes to not only design, but build and commission and maintain a building. It's all behind like in a black box and people don't know what's going on. So that's number one. Number two is to improve the human experience within the industry. So how people treat each other, how people communicate, have those effective conversations, treat difficult situations. So, yeah. So by doing that, you know, I think there's it, that helps to combat the culture of kind of treating people like shit, especially when you're talking about, you know, general contractors to sub trades or even owners to general contractors. There's generally a lack of trust, treat people like shit. A lot of the time, the trades themselves you're treated like animals. A lot of times people don't have yep. clean washrooms or a washroom at all to use on site, like basic human needs. And um, and they're treated as a resource to get a job done. When behind each one of those individuals is a person with a family and friends, their own mental health challenges, their own you know mouths to feed and all that stuff. So, yeah. No, that's good, man. That's, that's awesome. That's, that's true. a lot, buddy. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. You could have kept going, man. You're like 45 minutes more. You could have just kept talking, dude. Yeah. Who yeah. cares? I'm just, I was just listening. Oh, yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think uh, this generation has more of an uh, a uh, an idea of work-life balance than maybe the older generation didn't. It was more work, work, work. And, yeah. you know, there is that that divide. And I do remember having a, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question and shut up because this isn't about me, but I did have a hmm. foreman who, you know, when I started trying to really build on my career, I was like running a job under him. And I really wanted to try to build a mentor mentee kind of relationship with him and learn from, him. even though I knew I didn't like his attitude, <laughs> I tried mm -hmm. to build it with him, but it was just like, 
just not happening. His attitude would not let it happen. So yep. yeah, no, I've experienced this. So that's awesome. Let me ask you, uh, let's hop right into it. Cause I, I really want to talk about mentorship and I want to mm -hmm. hear everything you have to say about it. So let me ask you first question. What is the benefit of having a mentor? Maybe I should ask first, what is a mentor in your words? What is a mentor? Yeah. So I guess I remember looking it up once and the definition was something like, you know, uh, somebody who provides guidance and wisdom and high level kind of career experience, but that's like the boring stuff, right? To me, and we'll kind of, we'll dive a little deeper into this in, in a minute, but uh, a mentor is really somebody who's there that's going to help you, who's been where you've been, and it's going to help shorten your learning curve. If I had to boil it down to one thing, that's it's somebody who's going to share where they fucked up to help you go faster. I hope it's okay if I swear. Can I swear on the show? Oh, you're, okay. you're, you're good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, somebody who is going to take you under their wing and watch out for you. Now, having said that, it doesn't have to be a mentor or one person. And I think that's where, if I can, if I can jump into it now, that's where a lot of people are meted with, are met with frustration and uh, disappointment. And I know I've been there because I, I've never had somebody who, who said, Angelo, I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to tell you everything I know. And they do your best buddy and you go fishing and you hold hands and you skip into the sunset. <laughs> and you know what? Sorry to say to anybody listening that I'll, I hesitate to say never, but probably will never happen. But I'm sure if you've been in the industry five, 10 years, you can think of two or three people right off the top of your head that had an impact on your career. It might've only been a week that you were working with the guy. It might've been three months where you didn't work directly under a foreman or a journeyman, but you saw them every day or every week and, and you chatted or whatever. That's it. Like a lot of people are craving that formal structure to sit down on a weekly or monthly basis and have time set aside. And I'm sorry that there's just, Hey, there's no time for that. Cause everybody's stretched so thin now. Yeah. There's no time to like set time aside and B let's stop. Let's stop looking at it that way because you're just setting yourself up for disappointment. And a third part start taking a look around to see you know because if you if you were like i was and were frustrated that oh i never had this person that watched out for me when i started to think about it i was like holy shit there's three guys i can think of right now that really shaped my career one guy i worked with for three years so it was a lot more longer term he was a supervisor so we worked really closely together one guy actually i thought he was a dick because he was always really mean to me but then I, he taught me a valuable lesson about it. it's not personal it's just business and the interminglings between the two. And the third guy, we worked together for, it was like two months or something. But he told me a lot. And, he, you know, we really clicked. So I think that's one important part. And you you kind of brought it up when you were talking about your experience, how not everybody's compatible. So you, you might see somebody and be like, that's the guy or girl I want to be. That's what I strive to be. I need to connect with that person to spend time with them. So they like, they can, you know, tell me everything they know, or at least help me out. But if you're not compatible, it's not going to work out. It's like any other type of relationship, right? So yep. I think that's a challenge some people face. It sounds like you did too. Yeah. Oh, good answer. I, I think yeah. that, that, that that's a really good answer because yeah, I think we do look for like, oh, when can we have that like weekly call or something yeah. like that? And, and I think getting that smoke out of the way, that's kind of clouding what it actually is, is really important. So we could actually get a beneficial, something beneficial out of what mentorship actually is or learning yeah. from other people. And and just, just be upfront, right? Because like, I remember somebody told me a saying like frustration and disappointment come from unmet expectations. Mm. Okay. So if you go into a situation and you're thinking, I want this guy to help me and I need him to help me and my career needs it. The other guy might be thinking, why the fuck is Ruben hanging around here? This is awkward. Like, why? Just so just just talk to people and you don't have to say go on your hands and knees and say, oh, please, please be my mentor. But at least say like, look, buddy, I, I would be grateful if you could share some knowledge. And when you approach it that way, people love talking about what they know, Ruben. Yeah. Like people love bread. It, it's almost like bragging, right? If you if you come to somebody and say, "Look, Ruben, I really respect you. I think you're doing awesome things. Can you share some stuff with me?" You're probably more likely to say, "Hey, this Angel, he's a good guy. I'm going to help him out." And if I'm just hanging around you, being like, "Oh, can you show me how to do this? Can you show me how to do that?" Yeah, you know, 
Am I making any sense? No, yeah, you're making sense. You said something like that in the book too, um, where you were saying that, you know, if, if you are going to go look for a mentor, you should actually have like a purpose or a reason for finding a mentor. So uh, can you touch base on that? Like what should a person ask themselves? Like maybe they're not going to find somebody to just, you know, hold their hand and talk to them every week. But if somebody is looking out towards finding somebody to help give them guidance, what are some of the questions somebody should ask themselves before actually trying to look for somebody to mentor them? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good question. So a lot of people automatically assume a mentor is going to be, um, you know, if you're an apprentice, it could be a journeyman or, uh, you know, a foreman or a general supervisor or whatever. Um, so number one, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be somebody who's above you. It could be somebody equal who's maybe a year ahead of you or two years ahead of you. Cause yeah. yeah, the guy who's got 30 years experience can show you over the years what he's done. But if you're a, if you're, if you're a first year apprentice and you're talking to a fifth year, they can tell you what they've done in the last five years to kind of help you. Yeah. So it really comes down to getting an idea. I think it helps to know where you want to go with your career. Okay. Cause if you're, if you're an apprentice and your goal is to be a journeyman and that's it, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Cause not everybody wants to get into supervision. Not everybody right. wants to make a switch and go into project management, VP, whatever. So identify that right away. Because if you, you know, if that, if you want to make it to a certain level, you know, that those are the kind of people you're going to target and want to get in their good books and want to take up their knowledge. If you're not sure, and you make trying to make connections with this guy, that guy, everybody, you're just going to end up spinning your wheels. So mm -hmm. it helps, uh, it helps to get a crystal clear vision of what you want to get out of your career. And also time-wise too, right? Um, to talk a little bit about that, any type of goal you have, it's got to be you know clear, but it's also got to be realistic. Because if you're a first-year apprentice, obviously you have to go through your apprenticeship. So it's going to take three, four, five years to, to get there. You can't say, oh, next year I want to be a journeyman. Or if you're in the office and you're a coordinator, you can't say in five years, I want to be a VP. Because unless your dad owns the company, that's that's not going to happen. So, you know, getting a clear idea and coming up with a plan, that'll help you identify who you need to uh, help get you there. Nice, nice. I like that. All right. So uh, you mentioned this in the book as well, because you say like there's some people that are, say they're looking out for a mentor, but in reality, they're kind of just looking for somebody to kind of coach them. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give an example, like the difference between a coach and a mentor? Somebody just, if, mm -hmm. if that's it, I don't know if you think that's a good question or not. That's a great question. And uh, first, I just want to say you actually did read the book, buddy. Appreciate that. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, I didn't just I didn't just say I read the book. It's it's funny. I've talked to some people and been on like shows like this. And it's like they've got the book in front of them and they're looking through the table of contents being like, oh, I see you wrote about this. But you actually read it, buddy. So thank you. <laughs> well, so there there is a distinct difference between a mentor and a coach. A coach provides, you know, specific instruction on how to do a certain task. Okay. So if you were in a certain situation, say you were, I don't know, trying to solder four inch copper pipe to, to use an example, you would need somebody to coach you and show you the exact steps on how mm. to do it. Where a mentor provides a little bit more higher uh, advice, I guess. It's not specific, do this, then do this, then do this. It's, oh, I was in a situation like that one, three times. One time I did this and this happened. Another time I tried this. So it's a little mm -hmm. bit more higher level, less procedural. Yeah. That makes sense. No, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and uh, a coach, you know, once they help you with a specific, like I coach my, my son and daughter's baseball team. So to use that example, you show a kid how to swing a bat. Okay. Once they know how to swing a bat, you could take it to the next level and, and do get into all sorts of techniques, but it's like, okay, that task is done. What other tasks do we need to tackle as a coach? Whereas a mentor, it's more of like general management of the team. Like, get, you know, you can, you can uh, bat. This kid needs work on throwing. That kid needs work on, and you kind of help, you know, put all the pieces together, how they work as a team and all that stuff. It's a good example. Yeah, I, I'll be honest. Uh, I have an idea of coaches, but I, I like how you explain that because I didn't even think about that. Like the coach will walk you step-by-step step through something and show you how to do it. But mm -hmm. a mentor is going to actually guide you with his experience and examples from his own life and kind of help point you in a particular direction, I guess. Right. 
Yeah, like a mentor might might help you avoid a situation where you need a coach. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you might have gotten into a predicament because you didn't have somebody kind of overseeing stuff. But yeah, that's no, good. One you know, thing to say on that before we before we move on is like if anybody's listening and uh, and you feel discouraged or you're upset because you haven't you know been lucky enough to have that experience, don't feel bad. Like you're not alone. Like a lot of people. Um, unfortunately fall under shitty leadership and because there's a lot of weak leaders in yep. I think any industry it's the, the world but uh, I only know construction that's the only industry I've worked in so you know don't feel bad don't feel too jaded hopefully because uh, there are good people out there and that's you know one thing maybe we can spend a little bit of time on if you want is because it's kind of related to this is networking right the importance of building a diverse network being likable and you know getting people of all different uh, walks of life and ages and trades, uh, all that stuff being part of your support system. You know, I, I like that. I remember one time, um, I forgot where I read it. It was in some uh, like discipleship book. And um, they were talking about same thing like mentorship. You're training somebody. But uh, he basically said, it's like paint, like a painting. You know, you got the broad strokes, which I feel like mm-hmm. are the network of people, like the broad strokes that help shape your career. And then you got the fine little brushes strokes that like you mm-hmm. know touch stuff up and that's like that the mentor mentee relationship and you know they, sure. they, they all come together to kind of like paint a picture so yeah. i do love that you 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 kind of crafted that in the book and showed the mentor relationship but also the networking relationship and you said um i'm gonna read this uh it says uh where is it at because this, this i thought this was good it was uh I don't like how Kindle gives you your, uh, oh. your notes. <laughs> it says that uh, the old saying is on chapter 25. I mean, page 25, the old saying, mm-hmm. it takes a village to raise a child. It's, it's still true to this day. It can be applied to construction. It takes a team to build a building. Finally, taking it one step further to align with the theme of this book. It applies to your professional life. It takes a network to advance a career. And I like that. I love that. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. So, yeah, let's hop into networking, dude. Go ahead. No, no, there is, there's a lot of power in that. And uh, uh, and it's definitely, it's it's what helped me get to this point in my career is just knowing people. And one thing, and I preface this in the book and other stuff I talk about too, you can use these techniques to manipulate people. <laughs> like nobody, everybody knows a snake oil salesman when they see him, right? They, yep. they can get so far in the last little bit, but ultimately you're going to get exposed. So the stuff that I talk about, you can use it in an evil way or you can use it in a good way. For me, it was never like I wasn't scheming, twirling my mustache in the background being like, oh, I'm going to use this guy <laughs> to climb the corporate ladder and then I'm going to throw him into the mud and I'm going to use this guy. I just took a genuine care in connecting with people at a human level. It's like, yeah. You're not going to like all your coworkers. And somebody told me a good saying, you don't have to be friends, but you have to be friendly or you should be friendly. That's good. Because you never know when you're going to need somebody's help. Perfect example. Like, you know, I work in mechanical subcontracting. So we're kind of in the middle. So we typically get quote unquote screwed by GCs, but we also quote unquote screw our subcontractors. Okay. So there's suppliers. The truth for- comes out. No. <laughs> no, no secrets here, buddy. You know, there's suppliers, there's uh, subcontractors, there's other types of vendors. And uh, the the one example I talk about is like, when I was in estimating, we'd be closing a job. And I got to build up a pretty good relationship with one of the uh, HVAC equipment vendors. And I said, like, how do you guys work on your pricing? Like when we call and ask for your best price on closing day, and you give us your best price, and then our project manager gets handed the job, and then he asks you again for your best price, like, you know, something's not adding up here. And they basically build that into the, they build a buffer in, right? Mm. Because they know the price to give on closing day, they're going to get a haircut and have to negotiate something lower. It's no different when you look at, take out the dollars and you, and you look at, uh, um, you know, person to person interactions. Because if you've been in the industry and you've been burned, you're going to go into a situation with that buffer mm. and you're not going to be willing to be totally open and vulnerable and trust the person. When yeah. ultimately, what kind of relationship is that? It's like picture being in a relationship with, 
you know, your best buddy or your wife or spouse or girlfriend, or whatever, not trusting that person or them not trusting you, probably not mm. going to work out. Yep. But that's how we operate here. So anyway, getting back to the network building. So I've just taken, you know, a genuine interest in connecting with people. And I find people are really drawn to authenticity, just people yeah. being real, whether it's good or bad. People like it and it helps to connect with people. And so I kind of naturally did this with everybody, even if it wasn't like a direct supervisor or somebody that could ultimately benefit my career. But what that does is you start building up little support groups. So I talk um, in the book, I mentioned like there's three different levels. There's like your peers, your colleagues, there's your direct supervisors, and then there's the people kind of above that senior management, whatever site management, whatever you want to call it. And you really have to work at all three because if you suck up to your bosses, but you're an asshole to your peers, guess what? They're going to figure that out. Yep. And you're a dirtbag. Okay. If you're great with your peers and you're an asshole to your bosses, that's cool. You've got your support system, but you're never going to get promoted. You're never going to get ahead because you're, you're a dick, no matter how good you are at your job. So it's really important just to be nice to people and connect. And it's funny. Some of the people who have helped me out in certain situations I would have never guessed that they would have helped because they were in a totally different company mm -hmm. or whatever. But what I found in construction early on, regardless of what trade you're in, like you're an electrician, there's guys who have been in the trade 30 years, they're still learning. There's so much shit about the industry, even within a specific trade. You know, tools are changing, technology's changing, methods are being updated, new materials are coming out. You can never know everything. So, but you can know people that will lead you to get the right information. Okay. So no one person will know everything, but it's easy to like with me, myself, I'm not bragging, but you can probably ask me any question. And I'm probably four or five phone calls away from finding the answer because I'll call somebody and he'll say, I don't know, but try this guy. And then I'll call that guy. I'll say, Oh, Rob told you to call me. Oh yeah, no. Yeah. This is how you do that or whatever. So mm -hmm. super important. Just kind of don't, discredit don't don't look at anybody as oh this guy is useless i'm not gonna waste my time with him yeah i think uh all right i don't think i'm a jerk but i uh <laughs> not a good way to start a sentence i'm not a jerk but i'm very yeah. anti-social <laughs> and i've been very anti-social most of my life so i think i've i've squandered where i could have built those uh those networking connections i think i've done better yeah. in the last couple to a few years but yeah i had no i, I wish somebody would have told me that years ago like hey network with these people i had no clue what network meant so okay that's a very good question well first i want to ask you if you're a social why'd you start a podcast i'm not because <laughs> i get to sit in my room <laughs> i get to sit in my room yeah there you go. I, that's a good if answer. i get too awkward i could just hang up and just play that, that's a good answer yeah, yeah yeah or just pretend that your internet's cutting out or something no, no so uh so very good question and um and yeah, so one thing people are like, okay, Angelo, I hear you, but this that's not me. I'm not an outgoing guy and I'm not a schmoozy type of person. So I think what people think of networking, and I'm very glad you brought this up because it just brought up something else. A lot of people think networking, it's the person that goes to an event and they're shaking everybody's hand and they're cracking jokes and they're kissing babies and all this stuff. To me, that's not that's not networking, that's schmoozing. And when I talk about networking, it's more about connecting, not so much not so much the volume of getting your name out there and meeting a million people, but really focusing your efforts on making the right connections with the right people. And you don't have to go out of your way to, uh, to, you know, impress people. Cause what I found a great technique is like, um, frequent informal interactions, right? You could go to a trade show, you could go to a conference and everybody's there to network and meet people, but you mean so many people and you're only spending a couple minutes with them. There's no quality there. But if you're on site and you're eating lunch with the guys, perfect example, you might not even think you're connecting, but even just talking about their personal life, getting to know them as a person, what makes them tick? What do they like? What do they dislike? Their kids play uh, football. Oh, my kid plays football. Or what's your favorite football team? Oh, yeah, I don't like football. I like basketball. Oh, what's, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just... It, when you start to, it's not about, uh, you know, being the most likable person. To, to me, what it really comes down to is asking questions because that's what will keep the conversation going. Um, and yeah, when you, when you 
when you're trying to connect with somebody or trying to keep a conversation going, if you just ask them questions, find out what makes them tick. Once you hit that pressure point and you know what they like and what they're into and you start probing that, they'll open up, buddy. They'll open up mm -hmm. and they'll be like, wow, you know, Ruben asked me about something I'm really passionate about and he wanted to hear what I had to say. And then they're going to start forming that connection, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. I think for me, a, long, a lot of the time, I know it's maybe a little bit off topic, but maybe somebody can relate. I had so much of my own issues, you know, in my early 20s and my mid 20s that I had to try to figure out and deal with. Yeah. That, yeah. It was really hard for me to even care to ask somebody like, oh, I'll talk to people and we'll joke around. But for me to actually care <laughs> to delve into somebody else's life, I felt like yeah. there was just so much going on up here in my own life that I had to deal with that uh, now I'm better. And I, I didn't yeah. realize that, you know, talking to people and getting to know people, uh, you know, it's actually healthy mentally for you to get mm -hmm. over your own issues. But for mm -hmm. me, it was like, there was just a wall up. Cause I'm like, dude, I got, I got things to deal with right now. Yeah. So it was really yeah. hard. So thanks for sharing that. And, uh, and it brings me to kind of another point. It's like, everybody's got shit, man. Everybody's got shit going on. No matter who you look at, you think, Oh, this guy's got it made. Or, look, he's got a nice car and it's, hot wife and it's like he's probably got shit going on and the most beautiful moment for me and it's funny you mentioned that timeline is because i was the same and i think it's just a function of being in your 20s because you're trying to figure shit out a lot of times you're broke and you're just trying to be you know follow the path that society paints of like you get a job you get married you get a house you have kids you get a dog i got all that stuff only because I was kind of programmed to think that's what I wanted. It turns out it does align with my wants in life and I have no regrets. But the most beautiful moment I had in my life is I was really struggling with some personal stuff. And I remember sitting in my backyard and I was kind of looking off into the distance and uh, trees were blowing the wind. And I just kind of came to this realization because I had, I had read books, I was doing therapy, but it didn't hit me until that moment where I accepted it. And I was like, I'm really fucked up, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it wasn't like on the dumps. It was a really beautiful moment because I was like, I'm fucked up, but so is everybody else. Yeah. And it's how you deal with that, that we're not taught and everybody hides it. So you put on this mask and you put on this front and you go to work and you get the job done and something happens at work and it might be small. You might fucking be screwing in a, uh, installing a receptacle and you drop a screw and you could lose your shit because there's all this other stuff that's happened in the background, yep. right? That you just push down, push down, push down. And, but the pressure just builds up and it's, it's got to go somewhere. So I think that's part of connecting with people is realizing that everybody's got their shit to deal with mm -hmm. and it's okay to be vulnerable. But what we're taught in construction is that's not okay because vulnerability is a sign of weakness don't be a pussy, be a yep. man, suck it up, you know? Uh, but that doesn't work because when you come to work, you don't hit a switch and shut off your feelings and emotions Yeah, because you can't do that as a person. You might compartmentalize it and guys might think like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to suck it up and power through. But guess what, buddy, that shit stays inside you. And eventually it's going to come out, whether it's, you know, substance misuse, drugs and alcohol. I know we're going down a whole different topic now. That's good. You know, gambling, sex, all this type of these vices where in moderation, they're fun. Don't get me wrong, but it leads to excess and it impacts your life. So yeah. dealing with that stuff, but getting back to, you know, getting back to uh, mentorship and building your network and stuff. That's where the human side of construction to me is like super important because it's realizing, yeah, you know, it's a tough industry and we've got work to do, but you can't set aside the human aspect and the community and the connection to others that has gotten, you know, has helped man evolve to the point we're at now, you yeah. know, I'm mean, getting too crazy, Ruben. I don't know. We're getting a little existential now. I like crazy. I like crazy. Let's do it, man. Let's get, let's get crazy. <laughs> yeah. so I, I think that's important because granny, we talk about mentorship. We talk about uh, networking, but then we got somebody that's like us in there when we were in our twenties and they're like, who cares? I don't know how to network with the person. I don't know how to get, why would I get a mentor? Yeah. And so I think talking to some of these things, is, it's going to help somebody because, you know, they also have a bunch of stuff they're dealing with and they don't realize that they need to make some connections and, you know, yeah. I think it's yeah. good. Yeah. And like one, one thing that, uh, 
um, I didn't appreciate when I was younger, like early on in my 20s is, you know, when you get in, into your 30s and 40s, there's a lot of shit going on. And you, I remember thinking when I was like a teenager or younger, I'd be like, you look at my parents, they would have been about 40, be like, wow, these guys got everything figured out. They must not have any issues. They got all this money, they are working, they got this house. But it turns out like there's stresses that come with that stuff. Yep. You know, relationships aren't easy. Marriages aren't easy. Uh, mortgages aren't easy. Car payments, bills, all this stuff. So just if you're a younger person listening, just appreciating that, you know, if you're trying to connect with an older worker and they might seem like they're preoccupied with other stuff, it's because they are and they got shit going on. Yeah. And not to say like you should become their therapist and be like, hey, Ruben, tell me about your feelings. What's going on? <laughs> but just appreciate that. And maybe be honest saying like, look, I know you probably got a lot on your plate, but I'd really appreciate, again, setting the expectation. Yeah, I really appreciate if, you know, you could show me this or help me out. Or maybe they know somebody who would be better to... And again, that's how your network works because you connect with this person, then they connect you to this person, and then you make you have that. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, that's oh, good. Yeah, and you know, I think uh, two things you talk about in the book, and I think what you're touching on right now is one: if you're going to seek out a mentor, somebody's probably busy. Uh, figure out a way that you could. Uh, I think you said to like, how can you benefit them? You know, you're going to get something mm -hmm. from them, but you know, if you're coming up to them in a way like, hey. I'll help you do your website or I'll help you update this thing so that you could actually have that time with them where you're doing something to benefit them, but it's also benefited you because now you get to pick their brain or talk to them. And, you know, I think that's very beneficial. And another thing you touched on in the book was um, you should actually have a trajectory. It's not the way you said it, but you know, you should have like nowhere kind of you want to go in your career. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to, if you could touch on that a little bit, because it is hard. It, it took you, I like, I hated being an electrician for, for quite a mm -hmm. while because mm -hmm. I didn't know what I wanted to be in life. I didn't know what I was supposed to want to be in life. I didn't know how to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And it's good. Like now, if I had a mentor or, or if I had somebody, which I have a couple of people I talk to, but like, I know how to utilize that a little bit better. But when I was younger, it's like, I remember I was, uh, I used to teach Bible studies and stuff. And I was training under one guy. And the guy's like a phenomenal like pastor and teacher and stuff and very awesome dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we should have like these weekly or bi-weekly talks. And I felt like that mentorship was squandered because I had no direction. I had no clue where I was going. So I had no clue what to ask yeah. him or talk to him about. Yeah. And um, so could you talk just a little bit about figuring out direction or at least yeah. some sort of direction? Okay. Yeah. So for sure. Uh, before I jump into that, I want to touch on something you mentioned too, because it's really important and I might forget about direction. So I'm going to say direction yeah. again. So it's, it's stuck in my brain, but it, in any, whether you're trying to establish a mentor mentee relationship or just talking to Ralph at lunch break or whatever, it's important to keep the relationship two ways, like mutually beneficial, because if you're always going to the well and you're asking and you're taking and you're doing this, like you said, they get, you got to give something in return. So if you're a fresh uh, into the trade or into the industry, you might be like, well, what do I have to offer? There's a lot, like whether you know it or not, anybody. And I look at this when I, when I look at younger people that I train, it's like, I'm always learning stuff from them because I'm open to it. They don't even have to offer it up sometimes, but they do as younger people. And one thing, like one example off the top of my head is technology. So now a lot of stuff on sites going more digital iPads instead of blueprints, uh, you know, instead of filling out paper forms, there's like field wire and all these softwares. Yeah. So a lot of people struggle with that. So if there was a younger person that was adept with technology that could help them out, that's something, you know, that's one example of something you can offer up, but never sell yourself short and always try and make any relationship two ways because a one way, way relationship, it's only going to get you so far and it's probably going to end up with the burnt bridge and you're going to end up with somebody that's not going to give you a good review if they had to. So <laughs> yep. that's that point. And now uh, getting into the uh, direction side of things. Um, yeah. So it's funny that the example you mentioned, how you had that formal structure established and you had meetings set aside because I experienced that too. And I was so happy to get into that and being like, oh, this person can tell me everything. And then we ended up sitting down face to face every week just kind of staring at each other because you can't, you have to be, it has to be an active process. Yeah. Like if you sat down and said, 
and we had a zoom call we sat down and had a coffee and you said angelo tell me everything you know about construction it's like oh fuck like you know, where <laughs> do go. i start exactly yeah what are you gonna do so you have to get those juices flowing and a lot of people who are at that level where they they would make great mentors they don't have necessarily have the skills or ha definitely probably haven't been taught the skills to articulate the experience or to structure it in a way that it's digestible for somebody. They yeah. just know that if they encountered an issue on site, they would know what to do to fix it, but yeah. they might not necessarily know, okay, yeah, when you're 50% roughed in, you're probably going to encounter this. So you know what I mean? So it's yeah. got to be walking the job site, looking at stuff, dealing with, you know, certain issues. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of people going back to the whole direction thing, sorry, we're meandering back to that. Right. Um, yeah, a lot of people I think get lost, especially in the beginning of your career, especially if you just kind of fell into the trade or fell into the industry like I did. I was like, I never had aspirations to climb the corporate ladder or do any specific thing, but I kind of figured it out along the way through conversations, just being open with people, right? And it comes back to the whole thing where, Somebody might not feel comfortable going to a supervisor or a coworker saying, you know, I don't really like this. I don't really know what I'm doing because <laughs> yeah. people are, you're going to be afraid that people are going to look at you being like, oh, well, you're a liability or you're a waste of time. But guess what, Ruben? Nobody knows what the fuck they're doing, buddy. I'm still at 40. I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing with my life. Like, I feel like I've accomplished a lot, but I feel like I'm just getting going. I have a lot of passion and energy yeah. left and I don't know where it's going, but having conversations like this and talking to people and learning about experiences, it's going to help shape your career. So, yeah. you know, again, going back to the listeners, if you're, if you're early on in your career or even midway through being like, you know what, I'm not crazy about this. I don't know if I want to keep doing this. That's okay. Talk to people, explore other options. Maybe you can switch trades. Maybe you can switch from uh, the field to this uh, office or vice versa. Like it's never too late to make a change because yeah. And you mentioned it before too about you know younger generations valuing work life balance more. You spend 40, 45, 50, 60 hours of your week doing work stuff. So you better fucking at least be able to tolerate. Because if it doesn't yeah. light you up in, in some way, shape, or form, you're wasting so much of your life doing it, buddy. Yeah. No, am I wrong? Nope. Nope. Yeah, that's a sucky yeah. life. Yeah. And I get it. You gotta pay the bills. And I guarantee you anybody who's working for somebody else is not 100% fulfilled working their dream job. I'm not saying you, you should strive for that, but you should at least find something that's meaningful and, you know, you enjoy the the people you work with and the work that you do. And if I could get on my soapbox a little bit about the construction industry is that's one thing that I learned pretty quickly in my career that nobody told me was just the satisfaction of building a building, doing something with your hands and making it come to reality and then having somebody use it. Yep. It's like the most beautiful thing in the world, man. And I'll tell a quick story if it's okay. Go ahead. About uh, um, the previous company I worked with, uh, Elliston, they're, they're like one of the biggest GCs in, in Canada. They do all sorts of stuff. We built a hospital. Okay. So I was on the job for four years and uh, we built the hospital. We had just got substantial completion and I was leaving the, the trailer going back to the parking lot. And I remember looking around and uh, there was like an elderly person with a walker. Okay. Look over here. This is, not, this is cheesy, but I swear to God, I, I'm not making this up. There was a woman pushing like a, a baby stroller, right? It's like a mom with her baby. They're all going to the hospital. And I said, I said, holy fuck. Like I spent four years of my life stressing about this, fixing problems, wanting to give up. And now it's done and it's going to change these people's lives. It's a structure that's going to be there long after I'm dead. And it's going to serve this community. People are going to go in there to have their babies. They're going to go in there to get their treatments. If they break their legs. They're going to go in there to get better. And some people are going to die there, which sounds kind of morbid, but that's part of life, buddy. Yeah. And all these people are going to have these experiences. And uh, I was like, holy shit. And that's, I took a picture of the building that moment. And I wrote something on LinkedIn to that effect. And that's what started this whole human side of construction was that moment. And people latched onto that. And that's, you know, that's what construction is all about. You know, yeah. the buildings that you work in, the churches that you pray in, the malls, I know the malls aren't that much anymore, the office that you work in, the roads that you drive on to get to, to the, it's all part of the construction process, man. Yeah. 
but people don't know about it. Yeah. Don't know why. Don't know why. It's confusing. It's confusing. Yeah. I've never anyway. looked at it like that, but that's awesome. You've given me a new perspective. Yeah. I'm no, I think everybody, that. that's, that's the beauty of construction. We're not just building shit. You're shaping society. Yeah. You know? It's, it, there's huge honor and pride in doing that. And I think a lot of, you know, there's a lot of humility in the construction industry, but we undersell ourselves, buddy. Yeah. Like, Anyway, I'm getting emotional here, buddy. We're getting fired yeah, right. up. The juices are flowing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. I, I think I think your pers- this is exactly why I wanted you on the podcast. I think your perspectives are 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 fresh perspectives. They probably mm-hmm. shouldn't be fresh perspectives. They should be what we all think about, but they they are fresh perspectives. Mm-hmm. And I think I hated what I did as an electrician for a long time because for me, I'm a four time dropout that you know spent time in prison, got mm-hmm. my GED there. So for me, it was like. It was a, uh, it was plan B. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm cleaning my life up. Now I'm going to get into construction like every other ex-criminal does. Right. Mm-hmm. So for me, it wasn't, it didn't seem like an honorable thing or it didn't seem like a really, uh, you know, high thing. It was just like, oh, just another construction worker. And it took years for me to realize that, oh, wait, no, this is actually a good industry. Mm-hmm. This is actually something somebody should pursue. And like you, I, I fell into it because I didn't really have too many options, too many options. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, so it took a long time for my perspective to change and for me to realize, you know, kind of this beautiful process that I'm a part of in helping build and shape society. Yeah. No, that's that's really cool. And thanks for sharing that story. And I think that's amazing, man, your experience and how you ended up in it and you know where you are today. And that's uh that's really cool. But I, I think it is perspective right and i've shared this story before and you might have heard it you can stop me if you want to but it's i'll uh, shoot it i think i think it was from a simon sinek talk which you know if if you haven't read his books or checked them out he's amazing uh, like human performance and stuff but he talks about uh, a story of a person working uh, walking up to a construction site okay so there's two masons there working a couple hundred feet apart and they're laying brick building this building so he walks up to the first one and he says you know sorry to bother you. I just want to ask you a question. Do you like your job? And the guy's like, actually, no, I hate my job. It's like, I'm here doing brick after brick. Same thing. It's hot out. It feels like the job's never going to get done. I just want to get the hell out of here. He goes, okay, thank you for your time. He goes on to the next, the next person. Asks the same question says, Oh, you know, sorry to bother you. You, you know, quick question. Do you like your job? And that, that one goes, Oh, I love my job. You know, yeah, I'm doing the same thing over and over again. It's hot outside. In the winter, it's snowy. And it feels like I'm never going to get done. But I'm building a, a cathedral, mm. right? So the perception of like seeing the big picture. And yeah. some people roll their eyes at this stuff. But I think it, this is like what ultimately comes down to why we do what we do. It's a purpose. It gives you a purpose in life. Like yeah. you as an electrician, you're not just pulling wire and, and conduit and making connections you're making a building come to life yeah you know and people are going to plug in their appliances they're going to plug in uh, life support they're going to do li- like you're making a difference in somebody's life and i feel like if you look at that same thing on the office side if you're a project coordinator and you're just submitting shop drawings guess what that building wouldn't get built without that process so you're yeah. part of the bigger thing so you know giving people that vision and looking at that big picture i think you know it uh should get people fired up. Yeah, I feel like that's been missing for a long time. I feel like that's a very a thing that maybe a very small percentage of people, you know, mm. like really view it that way. And I think that that is a perspective we should have on this to where we're taking pride in our work. Because I think younger yeah. me would have enjoyed what I did more if I had that type of perspective. Okay. Yeah. I, well, I think I, anybody, because it's not, it's not separate from you or me or anybody. It's basic human desires right yeah to be appreciated to be recognized like hey i see you i appreciate you and to be contributing to something bigger than themselves yeah so to me in construction you can make a decent living i know it's arguable when you're starting out because it's pretty close to the minimum wage but once you hit journeyman if you go foreman or higher or whatever you can be making some pretty good coin pretty quick if you're willing to work overtime especially younger guys yeah. okay the recognition is not there because people are treated, especially on big jobs, commercial, industrial, you're just a resource to get a job done. Yeah. You're one of a thousand guys on site. And if you if you die or you get sick, 
they'll find somebody else to do your job. So you're commoditized. So the appreciation recognition isn't there. And we don't do a very good picture of, of painting that broader thing and how they're contributing to, you know, a bigger purpose and uh, moving things forward. So I don't know. Is that too wishy-washy? No, 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 that's good. My question now is, okay, so because this is a somewhat of a battle between ideas and one idea that's being fed to us is that you're just a number. Yeah. You know, and this is what burns people out. I've been to plenty of companies where you're just a number. Yeah. And now then the perspective that we should have that we're actually building something. So how do you, uh, Angelo, how do you combat those thoughts, those ideas that come in that you're just a number, just a cog in the wheel, maybe somebody at work's making you feel that way. I, I don't know your work, you know, experience, but how do you combat those thoughts in life to find purpose and find meaning continuously if you do? That that's that's a good question, man. That's a good question. And I think it's it took me a long time to to work on because whatever factor in my life, I don't know. I'm a people pleaser. I'm a recovering people pleaser. So what people say about me or think about me, it means a lot to me. Less now, and I think it comes with age and maturity. But the best thing you can do in your life is not give a fuck about what other people think about you. And I don't mean be be ignorant and belligerent and tell people to screw off. And I just mean like if you run into a situation where you're working under a bad boss and they're treating you like shit, that's on them. That's not on you. If they're treating you like a piece of shit, it's not because you're a piece of shit. It's because they're a piece of shit. And changing that perspective. So unfortunately that's tough for a lot of people. Myself now, I've done a lot of work on it and I still kind of struggle with it a little bit. But so I think it comes from like a little bit of uh, self-reflection, introspection, and just working on it. And again, going back to like um, direction or having an idea on the trajectory of your career. Like you can almost, if you know where you're going and know what kind of person you are and understand your goals and your values, that'll help you combat all the negative shit that could be coming your way. Mm. Now, a message now to people who are, in a supervisory role, whether you're a journeyman who's overseeing or uh, helping an apprentice or foreman or whatever, like just understand the basics of what may make people tick. And funny, I have this beside me and it's not my book, but it's another one how to win friends and influence people. That oh. looks backwards to me. I don't know if it's like, I, everybody should read this book, man. Yeah, I've read I'm that. trying it's to get my, one. I'm trying, my kids are young, but I'm, I'm putting it on a bookshelf and I'm going to make them read it. But the, the one thing, it said in one of the chapters I just read is the best way to make somebody or not the best. The only way to make somebody do something is to make them want to do it. Yeah. Right. Cause a lot of times in construction, it's the same yell, scream, threaten, uh, criticize. Right. So that'll get the job done while you're right there. But the second you leave, you're going to say, Oh, fuck that guy. You know, but if somebody comes, in and says, look, you know, and pumps you up and does some positive reinforcement rather than negative consequences, yeah. you're going to want to do a good job because it's going to feel good to you, not because you're going to be afraid of getting yelled at or something. Yeah. So, and that kind of ties into, you know, treating people well, making them see the big picture. And uh, yeah, I think that will help, you know, if you're in a supervisory type role, that's going to help inspire people, you know, not make them work faster because they're afraid they're going to get fired, but make them work faster because they want to do a good job and they want to learn. They want to do better. They want to help the project and they see how their contributions are helping out the big picture. Make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. That's good. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I I think that's a, there are some crappy bosses out there. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. (laughs) But unfortunately, I I, I think that's good. And I, you know, I think, uh, you said something in the book about like when you're around people and they're not like, like basically if they suck and they're not out for your best and they're holding you back and it's not the best work environment, maybe it's time to look for another job. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like having that, you mentioned a little while ago, having that view of where you're going. Cause when you know where you're going, it's like, okay, this isn't the place that's going to help me get to where I'm going. I keep a positive attitude because I got, you know, my, focus on this, uh, on this uh, goal. And then mm-hmm. you can look for another job and leave. So I, th- I think, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, having focus is good. Sorry. I, I wanted to go back to the focus point on, you know, having a goal. Cause I thought that was, no, really no, good. no, that's, that's a good point. Cause uh, you need to have that focus, but like 
it's in it, and I have to watch myself because it's easy to say, oh, if you're not happy where you are, just quit. But for some people, a lot of people, that's probably not an option, right? Yeah. Because you got bills to pay. Everything's so goddamn expensive now. Like you know, you can't uh, you can't just rage quit and figure something out, or you might not be able to find yep. another job. But you can, you know, it takes a little bit of time. And you have to invest your own free time, but you can always be working on yourself. Yeah. Whether it's applying for jobs or putting in the like reading books, there's so much information available out there, podcasts, audio books, YouTube, you got to be careful with internet stuff, but you know, there's so much information out there. You can always continue to work on yourself because when the time is right and and another opportunity does come up, you know, putting that effort in and getting that certification or doing that training or getting that ticket, it's, it's going to help you. So yeah. Even if you're not happy in your nine to five, you can always be, you should, you should always be continuously working on yourself to you know, create those opportunities. Well, that's good. You know, I, I do got to mention this though, because in the back of the book of, uh, you know, the human side of construction, there is this portion on uh, basically career building and plotting your course. Do you want to just share a little bit about that? Like the benefits somebody could get just kind of going through that. Cause I feel like we're touching yeah. on that right now. No, no, no. And that's a good point. And when I first wrote the book, it's funny you brought that up because uh, you get 10 points for reading the whole thing, making it all the way to the end. I just read the but, first uh, and last chapter. Not to play. <laughs> <laughs> One of those, eh? Oh, how does the yeah. story end? Yeah. Oh, don't ask me about uh, the middle. Yeah. But those, I made an appendix, right? There's an appendix A, B, and C. And uh, it was originally the first three chapters of the book. And I was like, I was thinking about it. I was like, you know what? With, the, with this type of crowd construction, they're going to read this. They're going to be like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? So I almost cut it out completely. But I ended up leaving it as an appendix. I, I was like, okay, if there's this reference here, if you want to look at it, go ahead. But I think that's going back to what we were talking before, because a lot of people either fall into the industry or use it as, or it becomes a last resort, not a first choice. They feel like they're just, they've been handed this, uh, They've been handled these, handed these cards and they just got to play their hand. But there is some power that you have, man. And it's not about, uh, you know, coming up with some crazy plan on making some life altering move, but it might help you think and align and help create some alignment in your life with, okay, this was a goal I had in my life and construction might not line up exactly to that. But if I do this, this, and this, it's going to help me get close or it's going to help me get there. Yeah. And I think, a lot of times we don't take that time to do that introspection and work on yourself and think about, you know, I'm, I'm on this path, but I don't have to put the blinders on and go in autopilot. Like I can think about where I want to go and kind of, I might not be able to do this, but I might be able to kind of go like this with my career and come up with this plan and help align things. Yeah. I used alignment a lot there. I don't know if I no, made any good. sense there, Ruben. I think your point was alignment. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so I'm glad you you saw some value in that and you brought it up because it's something that I think is really valuable. But um, I think not everybody is into that stuff. So that's why I kind of tucked it in the back there. No, no, I think that's really good because I think when somebody reads it, probably with the, with the perspective I was reading it in, once you get to the back, you want to do something. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, like you get so much inspiration and so much encouragement and Honestly, once you start looking around, you're like, well, you know, there's so many, op so many obstacles, so, so much opposition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the one thing that you could control is yourself. You know, I might not mm -hmm. be able to change my boss, but I'd be able to change, you know, my company right now, but I could change myself. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end, it, you put it in the perfect spot. Cause at the end, when the book is done, when you, somebody got all that information, they're able to now, if they want to apply it, if they want to actually change their trajectory, they have this awesome resource that you know that they could take they could utilize they could implement and you know, i i think you you put it in the right spot in the book no that's good man appreciate that and i like it means a lot to hear you say that about the book ruben i really appreciate that and uh i'm glad that it brought uh brought some value to you there but i'm gonna recommend it when i finally get a team for this podcast that's gonna be one of the books that we go through yeah <laughs> no, appreciate that man appreciate that that's yeah, yeah. so it's funny, like when I started putting it together, because it was just some people say like, what's the point of the book? Is it like a guide? Is it a how-to guide? I'm like, not really. It's just observations uh, 
and experiences that I've accumulated over almost two decades in the industry. And I was somewhat surprised to hear that other people felt the same way as me, but that just gave me more fuel to, to get this, uh, this message and this content out there. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, uh, it's not life altering and it's not like some secret uh, recipe. It's just, it's basic stuff. And some people might scoff at it, but it's, it's silly to me that this type of basic stuff is missing in the construction industry overall. Yeah. Like everything now has become so transactional and every job ends up in court and everybody just goes back to their scope schedule and budget and contract and fuck this trade, fuck that trade. I'm just getting my stuff up. It's like, it doesn't have to be like this guys. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, that just causes fights, frustration. The lawyers are taking all the money and uh, everybody's getting upset and it's putting all this stress on, on uh, uh, the site workers right the construction workers yeah it you know, is because it's not the it's not the guys sitting in the office at the end of the day that have to be like bear the weight of these decisions it's the guys in the field turning wrenches and screwdrivers that are under these tight deadlines you know so yeah yeah you know i i since becoming a journeyman and a and a contractor i, I i've given myself the freedom to not you know to not care what the you know how bad the foreman is on a job site because yeah. before somebody would be talking smack to, you know, being just a jerk to my coworkers, but I can't really do anything about it because I like my job. But now, <laughs> but now I don't put up with people's crap on job sites. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love, I don't even know. I'm probably going off topic. It just reminded me of this, but I love stopping the foreman. I don't care if he's my boss or who he is. I like being in the position where I don't let people talk down to other people, mm -hmm. call somebody out on it. And you know what I realized? And I don't want to talk too much. I really want to hear what you have to say. But most people have never been called out on their attitudes or on, you know, their character. And they think it's okay. Maybe they grew up, yeah. you know, being trained by an older generation that just put them down and, you know, just drove them hard at work. And they're going to do it to the next guy. And they think it's okay because nobody said anything. Yeah. And uh, I have no clue where this came from or why I'm saying this, but I don't know. It just sparked into my head. But um, it's no, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that, that was it. I just, I like standing up and talking smack to the foreman now. That, uh, that is, there's a lot of power in that, I think. And if you go about it the right way, I think the foreman or the person you're calling out would probably respect that. It's yeah. one thing to say, hey, you know, start swearing at him and yelling at it like that. I wouldn't go about it that way. But if that. you just, if you just call him out, even, so what I found is is a good technique too is maybe not catch them in the moment, but do it one on one. Yeah. You know, if there's something happens and they're being a dick to somebody, it would help to build credibility with the other guys if you call them out in that moment, but then you're putting them on the spot and you're embarrassing them. Yeah. But if you approach them after behind the scenes and say, Look, I know this happened, you handled it this way and it probably wasn't the best, that might make them think a little bit more versus acting defensively and maybe resulting in a fist fight on site, which happens. Yep. But uh, that depends on your personality and, and situations. But it's funny you say that too, because, you know, what happens when you stand up to a bully? Oh, I have no clue what. Give me nothing. The oh, nothing. Because bullies operate under intimidation and yeah. under the assumption that nobody's going to stand up to them. And when somebody finally does, they lose their power. Yeah. If that's all they got, then, then they got, you know, they got nothing else. So, um, so yeah. yeah, it's important to know how to handle those difficult situations and have those conversations that, because they come up and inevitably in construction, there's so much conflict, whether it's your foreman or another trade or a project manager or an engineer, people are going to come on site with different attitudes and knowing how to, how to diffuse them. And, yep. uh, it, it, that's a critical, uh, skill to have in the industry how to win fr friends and influence people might be a good there you go buddy <laughs> check it out after you read the human side of construction yes yeah exactly <laughs> uh, what, what's cool about these books right like there's this one i got a box set there's this one how a man thinketh think and grow rich these books were written like the early 1900s yeah. but it's it's the same stuff we're dealing with today it's basic human needs it's psychology when it comes down to it yeah. And regardless of what position you're in, 
I'm sorry to say, but you're in sales. You're a salesperson. If you're dealing with people, you might not be selling a phone or a pen or a widget, but you're selling an idea. You're selling your position. And it comes down to how you, to deal with people and yeah. in psychology, how people think, how people approach different situations. And uh, yeah, I don't yeah, know where no. that came from. That was my random ad there, Ruben. No, you're good. I like it. That's good because I, I think that's important. We're dealing with people. If you're looking for a mentor, if you're trying to have a better experience at work with a, you know, some sort of a toxic boss, you're dealing with people. And I think if we get better at dealing with people and understanding people's psychology, we can maneuver our way through life without, with, with a lot less stress and headache. Yeah. You hit the nail right on the head. You summarized everything that I've been working towards in my life in one eloquent sentence. I don't know how. I never thought about that before. But what it comes down to is just making the world a better place by reducing stress and eliminating all this unnecessary bullshit that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't have to be like that. So yeah, appreciate that. I'm sorry. I got to cut out in a couple minutes here. I got a, I got a 9.15 no, you're stop. Good. You're good. But uh, All right. So last yeah. question. Last okay. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So if you're, if you had an evening to, to mentor your 20 year old self, what would you tell them? Oh my God. That's, and you that's only got a couple good. minutes too. You only got a couple minutes <laughs> running out. Time, time's we quick. might have to go. We might have to go late on this no, one here. Cause that's, no, that's a very good question. So it, it's funny you say 20 because I was just coming out of school at that time and I didn't know what I didn't know. Because I thought I knew everything, yeah. Especially coming out of the schooling system, where the professors pump you up, and you come out, and uh, you know, in the Canadian engineering system, you get an iron ring. You know how pretentious is that? You get an iron ring when you graduate, so everybody knows you're an engineer. <laughs> and honestly, it's that that. Actually, I did a post on this, so I'm going to rip it off if I remember it correctly. Do it. Uh, you don't know everything, and neither do I. Yelling at people doesn't make them respect you. And it's who you know, not what you know. Okay. So just to kind of quickly dive into those three things. You don't know everything, neither do I. Admitting that you don't know something. Because in construction, a lot of times people are afraid to admit, ask for help, whether they're struggling with a specific task or they're struggling with a mental health issue or whatever, because you don't want the other person to think that you're weak and that you're no good to the team. Mm. Okay. We talked about this earlier, but... Forget about that shit because everybody's dealing with stuff. Everybody, it's human nature to, you know, feel insecure and be vulnerable and have these weaknesses. So get off your high horse and, you know, let's just stop being dicks to each other. Okay. Number two, yelling at people doesn't make them respect you. This is a really good one. Instruction, like we talked about before, is like positive reinforcement works way better than negative consequences. The problem is negative consequences work very well in the short term. Yeah, so negative consequences do not work as good as positive reinforcement. The problem is that negative consequences work really, really good in the short term. And a lot of construction functions live in the short term because everybody's looking like one week ahead, two weeks ahead, three days ahead. Whereas like, so if you're, if you're beating everybody and you're saying, oh, we got to get this done in two weeks. Once that two weeks is done, it's like, Guess what, guys? There's another milestone six months from now. And the guys are like, oh, shit, now we're just going to get beat up again. But if you give that positive reinforcement, it it might not be as effective right there. But in the long run, it does wonders. Okay. Yeah. And then the uh, the third point. Oh, yeah, it's not what you know, it's who you know. That's all about network, man. And it's not saying that you shouldn't focus on technical skills and you can float by by doing absolutely nothing because you need to do the basic requirements of your job or else you're no good to anybody. But the impact of what you do and how you make people uh, and how you do it is way more powerful than the nuts and bolts of what you're actually doing. And that reminds me of another touchy-feely saying that might be a good way to to segue into a finish here is it's a Maya Angelou quote. It's like people will forget what you say They'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Mm. And I can think back to a lot of situations I had in life. And, you know, you can be the best person in your company, your state, the world, technically. But if you're an asshole, nobody's going to actually want to work with you. Yep. And what kind of legacy is that to leave? You know, Ruben was an excellent electrician. He was the best electrician, but he was a terrible person. He made me feel like shit all the time. That's what they're going to remember about you, right? Yep. 
that's what I would say to 20 year old Angelo. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, hey, Angelo, I appreciate you. I recommend anybody that's listen that was listening to this, get his book, The Human Side of Construction. I guarantee you it's such an awesome book and it's going to benefit your life. It's going to benefit your career. I highly recommend it. Angelo, thank you, man. I just wish the uh, best of success for you, for your family and for all your endeavors. And I hope we get you back on the podcast at some point in time. That'll be awesome. We'll do, man. We got so much more to talk about. We I should know. make a series or something. Let's do it. Anyway, again. no, I appreciate I appreciate you having me on, and uh, it's really been a pleasure. And I appreciate what you're doing. Appreciate you, and uh, yeah, keep doing awesome things, buddy. We're making a difference. Thank you. Awesome. All right, Angelo, I'll let you go. Thank you. Okay, thanks, buddy. Take care. You too. Bye. Right. <laughs>